when you're a little kid, there's something beautiful and generous about asking an adult for some advice. Yeah. What you have to recognize is that that's generous. Mm -hmm. You got to lead with generosity. When you're building relationships, you lead with generosity. Hi, and welcome back everybody to the Everything is Influence podcast, where every week we dig in to really what ultimately motivates people to do what they do. And this, on this day, I have the great fortune to be able to uh, connect with someone who is a person I've looked up to for a long time. And as on every episode, we unpack the four levels of influence. How do we influence ourselves? How do we take the thoughts and feelings and the mission and purpose that's inside of us? And how do we transfer that to another human being? That's level two influence. How do we do that to groups? That's level three. And then lastly, at scale, level four influence, how do we re replace ourselves through people and process and books and audio programs? That's the highest level of influence, legendary influence. And so it's with uh, great pleasure that I introduce you to a legend of influence, Mr. Keith Ferrazzi. How are you, sir? Eli, thanks so much. What a kind intro. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you. And so if we could kick this off, um, you know, for those of you who don't know who you are, or what you're up to, and I'm curious what you're up to in the world today, if you could kind of unpack it, we know you've read, you've written some amazing books, but what are you up to? What's your, your business about today? Um, we coach executive teams, full stop. Okay. Yeah. Um, Peter Diamandis, who's a good buddy of mine, and Tony Robbins says, what Tony does for individuals, Keith does for teams. Um, I'm not sure I can stand up to that scrutiny, but um, so we're, and typically in our world, we have, we have typically stayed in the fortune 50, fortune 100, fortune 500 world. So it's not a surprise that you haven't heard of the work we do very narrowly focused on helping to coach the transformation of the largest organizations in the world, companies like Delta Airlines, General Motors, et cetera. Um, when we work with a team, we basically um, spend a full day with the executive team once a month. And we're not coaching only to behaviors. We're actually coaching the transformation of the business. So it's their business agenda. And we're there a day a month for anywhere from six at a minimum to a couple of years. Um, well, so that's the work we do. I've got a new book coming out on high-performing teams. Uh, the last great book on high-performing teams was written by uh, Pat Lencioni, and it was over 20 years ago. So yeah. really focused on team performance is our, is our primary focus. And then the, um, what's interesting is I, I came up with a book um, just before the pandemic called Leading Without Authority. And I think that'll be a really great conversation for us to have about influence. How do you really lead in a world where uh, real movements of change don't have anything to do with your titled position or authority. Real movements of change have to do with your capacity to invite people in to co-create a future together, right? To truly go on a journey of influence. Um, and then during the pandemic, uh, we have a research institute focused on high-performing teams. I have been researching high-performing remote and hybrid teams since 2010. We've spent over four and a half million dollars just in high-performing hybrid and remote teams. The series was all published in Harvard Business Review, about 12 articles called The New People Rules in a Virtual World. And during the pandemic, we had 2,000 executives crowdsourcing. How do you not go back to work after this great inflection point? But instead, how do you leap forward? How do you go forward to work? And that book was called Competing in the New World of Work. And that just came out recently. Very, very proud of that book. Amazing. Let's check that out. Yeah, I saw you speak. I guess it was last year um, at the virtual leadership. Um, I got together with some of the plats of Tony's and I saw you speak and I was I was very moved by your by your presentation there. Oh, and, thank you. Um, yeah. I, so I, I kind of want to take a step back and we're you'll you'll see the syntax here. So how did you get into this? I I'd heard about you so long ago, obviously with the books and through um, just different friends. They're like, you have to check out this book, Never Eat Alone. Yeah. And read that. Wow, it was probably early two thousands, maybe two thousand five. Yep. And, yeah, yeah um, exactly right. Yep. Well, look, I mean, that yeah. book was certainly what put me on the map uh, in the general world, um, and it was written because I had a crazy amount of early success in my life. 
I was um, uh, first at Deloitte, where I was the chief marketing officer before I was 30. Mm-hmm. And then I was at um, Starwood Hotels and Resorts in the early days of founding that company. And um, as the chief marketing officer and head of sales there, it, that kind of success got some attention. And an article was written about me in Inc. The 10 mm-hmm. Secrets of a Master Networker. It was interesting because, and I didn't like, I hated, I hated that book title so desperately <laughs> that um, I wanted to combat it because it was all about this guy walking around, all the people that he knows, et cetera. I just so wanted to distance myself from that brand. I wanted to have nothing to do with it that I ended up saying, fuck it, I'm going to write a book because Mm -hmm. it's not about networking. It's about real relationships. It's about creating value. It's about authenticity. It's about vulnerability. It's about connectedness. And uh, so that's when I wrote Never Eat Alone. And that was, yeah, over, um, over 20, what is it? Um, 20 years ago, almost, uh, crazy. Yeah. And since then, you know, it gave me a, it gave me a point, right. I could either go in one direction where I could stay on the corporate ladder, but that book gave me such prominence in my personal brand that I could choose. Did I want to go and become a thought leader and be of service to individuals in their professional growth? And I sort of took the, the path that was a combination of the two, right? So I ended up starting a firm called Frozzy Greenlight that focuses on coaching organizational transformation through executive teams. So it was really a combination of the two. I, I continued to publish and work on my personal brand and thought leadership. Um, but at the same time, I stayed in the milieu of the large organizations. Amazing. And so when you were... When you were starting out at this company and you obviously had such big success at a young age, did what was it the, the defining moment for you, if you will, where you realized like the way that people are networking, the way that people are communicating isn't effective because the people listening to this podcast, a lot of them are salespeople, entrepreneurs, of course, they're networking and going to B&I meetings and handing out their business card and I do this and nobody listens to the person. They're just thinking of what they're going to say next. And so, you know, what, what did you see and what was the kind of the, the impetus for this, this need for change? Well, it wasn't, it, it wasn't that, I mean, I had seen this all along. I was father, following in the footsteps of, of my father, who was a, an extremely charismatic, deeply connected and caring guy, Italian immigrant, um, could talk to anybody from the Senator of Pennsylvania, you know, John Hines to one of his buddies who's a fellow immigrant steel workers. And I, you know, I, I saw what he really had in his life was strong relationships, curiosity, intimacy, connectedness. And what I recognized was that the people that he knew were not going to be the people that got me to where he and I wanted me to go. So he came to the United States wanting his son to have more success than he had. And what I realized, you know, and I got into a very small private elementary school and I was at the beginning quite jealous and thinking, Mm -hmm. why wasn't I born into one of these wealthy families? And, you know, similar to um, the the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and I've gotten to know the author, um, I realized that I could I could have nepotism through Mm -hmm. relationships. Nepotism is nothing more than a commitment that somebody has to give somebody a leg up if they care for them. Now, yeah, Yeah. you could be born into that or you could earn the relationships. So my tipping point was as a young kid, realizing that where I wanted to go, I needed to start building relationships before I, before I even needed them, right? Relationships with next, next generational kind of people. And so that, that became for me as when I was a kid, it could be just getting to know a lawyer, which everybody from my family was, blue collar. Um, and, and the audacity, the audacity to ask, but the audacity to ask matched with the humility of, of admiration and, mm-hmm. and vulnerability. So I would ask a buddy of mine who went to school with me, do you think your dad would be willing to spend a little bit of time with me, who's a lawyer, just to help me understand what it would take to go to live in a world that is very different than the blue collar world I live in today. Like, what do I have to study? What do I have to do? 
And just by, by putting, by humbling myself and asking good questions and asking for people to be my mentors. Now, mind you, it was this, when you're a little kid, there's something beautiful and generous about asking an adult for some advice. That's what you have right. to recognize is that that's generous. Mm -hmm. You got to lead with generosity. When you're building relationships, you lead with generosity, not with an ask. I get too many people coming up to me, you know, who adults, etc., and they'll come up to me and it's like, oh, I, you know, see you wrote this this book, uh, Never Eat Alone. Um, can Let's can see. I get some of your time? Yeah. I'm like, why? Like literally, if you want to take a look at my email box and how I have to have two full time assistants to just clear my e daily email box and get my meetings scheduled, why? Why would yeah. I spend time with you? I mean, not that I'm a shitty person, but why would I spend time with you? And mm -hmm. now, if you if you read my book or my books and write a beautifully compelling message that says, "Here's how you've inspired me. Here's what I've done." with your advice. I have a few really pointed questions that I didn't extract from your writings. Could I get some time with you? Then that might have a shot, right? Or, cause that's generous, right? Mm -hmm. Not just lazy, which is, you know, so I, I've talked to people who've said, I, can I get 15 minutes, pick your brain? Like, have you read my, any of my books? No, well, so why don't you fucking start there? Because <laughs> I've spent my lifetime giving my advice through my books. And if you're not even, if you're, if you're too lazy to even read my books to know what, how I think and what I've offered the world, then why am I going to waste 15 minutes of my time with you? Um, now, the flip side of that is um, somebody who really gets to know me and knows, you know, that my friend, uh, my foundation, what does my foundation do, right? My foundation focuses on foster care. And my foundation focuses on the advancement of human capital and entrepreneurial organizations. So, you know, my buddy, Tony Shea was one of the great innovators of, mm -hmm. you know, human capital. Um, yeah. and, and I have in my foundation, I started the Tony Shea award. So if somebody wow. wants to volunteer time and really care about people in the workplace and want to volunteer time to learn and grow in our foundation, I'll give you time, right? If you're equally interested in foster care and want to help our efforts in that regard, I'll give you time. Mm -hmm. Then through that time, you build rapport. You know, I've got a kid. I'll give you a, a, a story of two. And by the way, is this cool? You want me to keep going or you want me to answer? This is amazing. Question? Yeah, I've, this is I've amazing. Got, I really want you to kind of how did Keith become Keith? And so I'm yeah. getting uh, we're getting to understand your psychology and where where people get things wrong. So you're you're answering all my questions. OK, well, I got two kids to give you a juxtaposition of. I got one kid um, whose name is Michael and oh. Michael is the most lovely, caring, sincere, intimate kid I've ever met. He's now in his probably 30s. He's married. He's got kids of his own. But when I met him, he was either in senior in high school or um, he might've been in early college days. And again, he, he, he was so authentically reached out having consumed what I had to share, but had more questions. Yeah. And, yeah. and then as he did, he, I had just started at the time, one of my, uh, my business and he was working, maybe his dad or his uncle, I think was at Johnson and Johnson. And one of the things he said to me early on, he was like, Hey, you know, I, I gave my copy of your book to my uncle mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I, I suggested that he should hire you uh, to, to, to work with his team. Right. Oh. I'm like, holy shit. What? I mean, what a generous kid in terms yeah. of how he was thinking of other people. Right. He got my time and he has been a mentee and a young friend ever since. Whereas I give you another example of a, of a young guy who was at USC, I'm not even gonna say his first name, but every time, I mean, I could read his text, every time he texts me, he wants something. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. I mean, it, it originally I had gotten to know him because he was a group of young students who um, I had taken under my wing as a group and they were working on some internship projects for me. Um, and I can't even say that he was particularly, he didn't have a particularly strong work ethic even at the time. But, but I look at my text of the, to this kid, he's always asking for something. Just, yeah. just, just ask, ask, ask. And it's like, look at those two things. Somebody who's in it for them 
and somebody who is not only in it for others, but is just clearly an authentic, caring person. And mm -hmm. that's what Never Eat Alone really teaches, which is how do you walk around the world creating an environment around yourself, inviting your other people in? Now, this book, where is it go? Over here. This book, yep. uh, Leading Without Authority, we wrote because too often in organizations, people like your folks that follow you who are in sales, mm -hmm. they see problems in the company that need fixing. And they just sit on it and they bemoan it and they complain about it and they point fingers about it instead of stepping up and saying, I'm going to fix it. And when I was at Deloitte, the reason I became the youngest chief marketing officer in the Fortune 500 and the youngest partner ever elected was because um, the CEO was at the front of the room and said to an audience of 2,000 interns one summer, 2,000 interns, he said, you know what, one of these days I want Deloitte to be at the top with McKinsey and Accenture. At the time, it was called Anderson Consulting. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I sat and I listened to that. I was like, well, that's interesting. I wonder what it would take for us to do that. And I, I went on, I didn't, we couldn't Google. I went on and searched to see whether or not there was a, a book on professional services marketing. And there was something called, called Trusted Advisor. And I read mm -hmm. it, but it wasn't really it. It's a good book, by the way. Uh, Maester's book, Trusted Advisor, is a great book for any salesperson to read. But I realized there was nothing institutionally written about B2B marketing. Hmm. So I, I, I went to a professor of mine. I said, hey, let's, I want to do a project where I interview a bunch of professional services CMOs and accumulate a, a methodology for what it would it take to be a great professional services marketer. And I, I, I did some research. I found this guy, Bill Mattisoni, who was a, an alumnus at Harvard where I had been at business school. And I reached out to him and I said, hey, can I, I, I'd like to do a study of the great professional services marketers like McKinsey, Accenture, and others. And I then pull it all together and I'll hand it back to all of you, like a little mini Gertner Group research. Mm -hmm. So I did this. I interviewed eight different firms. And at the end of it, I sent it to everybody and I sent it to the CEO of Deloitte. And here mm -hmm. I was, I was 24 or something. I said to the CEO of Deloitte, I said, listen, I was in the audience. You didn't know even know me, but I took your your challenge to heart. And mm -hmm. here's a playbook for what world-class professional services marketing is, as compared to four different, I mean, eight different uh, organizations. He called me personally. And ultimately the, the story goes that um, he invited me to come into the firm full-time. I was an intern and I said, I would under the condition that he gives me one of these dinners with him once or twice a year. Yeah. And that was it. I mean, I had, I had gone above and beyond what any, any partner of his had ever done to help him achieve his dream. I was generous as hell. And yeah. I then got the personal time from dinner. He ended up becoming like a father to me. And I ended up becoming the youngest partner ever elected at Deloitte. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you unpack that in the book, I imagine, you know, for, for me, I, I got a job. At and I tell this story, by the way, in leading without authority, because that's the, that's the penultimate example of a child leading the firm. I was yeah. a kid without any authority. And anybody who's sitting out there is a sales rep who wants to get ahead in your career. This is what you need to do with your clients. This is what you need to do with your, with your own company, with your own CEO. It's a it's an interesting way to look at it. When I hear the word authority, so we're in sales and in this online marketing space, you see yeah. the people that are they have this perceived authority, and so some of it's um, unconscious communication. If somebody has a good posture, tone up, tone appearance, a lot of that strong intent, confidence, they can have this perceived authority. But a lot of people, and this was I think a lot of salespeople, there there's almost this pendulum we talk about. There's like over posturing, like hey, do you know who yeah. I am? And, this, yeah. this, you know, do you, like, well, that's just insecurity. You, you, you know, I mean, most of most sales reps are insecure. Yeah, I don't know what weird mind, what what weird fucked up childhood we must have had that put us into a career where we're constantly uh, told no to, right? I mean, this is a crazy, crazy mindset that we 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 uh, are just suckers for. Um, 
but it breeds such horrible insecurity in, mm -hmm. in people. And so many people, when they're insecure, either get big or they get small. And yeah. I think a lot of salespeople get big and that's the bragging, that's the feigned, you know, I got this. And the reality is <clears throat> people want to connect with people, real humans. Mm -hmm. And so in leading with authority, you talk about how to do without, this. How to, leading without authority. Without, without authority. Without authority. Um, without having that position, but using empathy and doing research to ultimately connect and move yourself ahead of the curve. So that is very much what you capture from never eat alone. When you go ahead to leading without authority, what we teach people is that the, the world, the, a lot of people want to be, want to be um, movement leaders. If you're mm -hmm. inside of a company or you're with a client, particularly if you're selling B2B, what you want to get them to see is that by virtue of hanging out with you, their future is rosier than it would have been otherwise. Sometimes if I just going to be crass, um, I'm saying anybody who's in B2B sales, the, the most important thing you're selling is the career advancement of the person who's buying. Mm. So if I'm trying to sell Eli, I got one objective. Where does Eli want to go in his career? Where does Eli want to go in his career and how do I get him there? And that is a hundred percent of what matters in um in b2b sales now a good product good solutions at all that stuff 100 right but at the end of the day what i'm trying to bring eli is advancement of his career and mm -hmm. that is going to be achieved um through me fully understanding where you're going where the stumbling blocks are and then of course how does the solution that i have to sell to you help accelerate that but not just the solution like when what, what you know if if my boss knows your boss or if we ever have a meeting with your boss my i've told my boss in advance make sure that you make eli look like a fucking superstar mm. right make sure that that eli wants to put me in front of his boss so uh -huh. because every time i do i am commenting on whatever we think that boss and if that boss is an SOB who only cares about grinding out price, mm -hmm. then I want you to make sure that you let that boss know that there is nobody that we face on a daily basis that gets a better price than Eli does. Whatever mm -hmm. it is. Or, you know, Eli is, you know, or, or, or understand where that boss wants to go. Maybe say that boss wants to become the next CEO of the company. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and by virtue of working with Eli, Eli, all Eli is focused on is how to make this department the world-class best department that will help advance the strategic capabilities of this organization. And I have to tell you, I've never met somebody better than Eli at putting the, the firm first and your vision, sir, first, because he, that's all he talks about is your vision, right? I mean, it's like, that's a, that's an act of generosity. Hmm. Yeah. Right? And that's just an example. You know, I talk about the generosity pyramid, um, we're at the bottom, you know, working your way up to the top of the pyramid. And, and at the top of the pyramid, at the end of the day, it's also not just professional success, it's personal. I have helped more of my friends. I, I used to work for a guy who taught me health, wealth, and children is what he told me. He said, you want to make, you want to create loyalty. You help a person's health, you help them get rich, which is in a sense, this business piece, or uh, you help their kids. Mm. You really so want to solidify loyalty. Yeah, speaking in terms of somebody else's interest, and if you're wondering what those interests are, there they are, right there. Health, 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 health. Children. I mean, that's yeah. the pinnacle, right? That's the pinnacle, you know. And for, for for me, what I want to see is a world of change agents. Everybody out there who's watching this, I want you to be ignited to be a change agent in your organization. And be, to be a change agent is the best way to accelerate your career. Too many salespeople are always looking at their comp structure, their, com, you know, their commissions, those kind of things. And the reality is, if you can be a change agent by, for instance, selling that next new solution to the next new client so that you can then be heralded by the sales, the head of sales to all other sales reps of, 
boy, this, this guy really knows how to sell our solutions at the next level, which of course, which is why the book, you know, leading without authority is important. The first step of leading without authority is to define your team. Defining your team means define the group of people that you're selling to. I'm sorry, define the group of people that you're co-creating with. Hmm. Define the group of people you're co-creating with, meaning your team is not who reports to you. Your team are those you need to achieve greatness. And that hmm. immediately shifts because most people think about those who they control or those who have you know immediate proximity. And then you got all these other people you got to go get buy-in from. Well, that's bullshit because I always say buy-in is bullshit. Buy-in hmm. means you've you've identified somebody you have to sell something to. No, you co-create, including your clients. Like hmm. co-creating, getting in there. I, I, I've coached the Accenture organization, hired us to coach all of their diamond account teams, which is the, the top of the top accounts that, that Accenture had. So we were coaching the diamond account teams in, in leading without authority, co-creation. I created a word for it. I call it co-elevation. When, mm. when you lead a group of people to go higher together, where they have a shared mission and they're moving on that mission together and their commitment is to each other and to that shared mission. Hmm. Yeah, this is powerful. I'm just coming out of a, a meeting in Phoenix. I, I took a red eye last night and I got here and we were, we were having these type of conversations. We use the word buy-in a lot in sales and with the team and all of that. And so, yeah, this is, you know, I'm, I'm going to share this with my, this, this podcast and my friends. So this yeah. is, this is interesting. And I'm, you know, as you're speaking, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a huge Tony Robbins fan, obviously. And um, some of the things that he did. So I lived with Tony's son, Jarek, for a few years and his brother-in-law, Scott Humphrey, who you might know, um, you know, and, and Jarek, of course, wanted to be on stage. And Tony was very clear about his uh, lack of a, you know, giving nepotism for lack of better, better words. And, you know, in Tony's organization, people now, you know, Tony texts me sometimes, we're still friends. And people often ask me how I got him as a mentor. I went above and beyond and I never asked for anything, but I, I gave a lot and it was always in support of his mission because what do you give a guy that has everything? And a lot of these people that we want to connect with, they have everything, but there's something on their heart. And so everything I did was to support something for him because what do you give somebody like that? And we had that common mission. We're co-creating something together. And so he's, of course, so loving and warm. He'll say we're partners on the same mission. And he would always hold me to that, stand, that standard. And so it was, it's interesting to see kind yep. of how you should, everybody should do that with their boss. They need to figure out what their boss's mission is or their client's mission. And you need to radically accelerate it. That's the ticket to success. And you do this with your clients as well. Find out what it is for them and your team members and the people that are, that are on your team. What are we no. co-creating for there in terms of their best interests, health, wealth, children? Yeah. That's fascinating. You know, I'm, I'm curious, and this is something completely off the subject, but it relates to that level one influence. Um, what do you think are some routines, things that you do in your day that are consistent rituals that have optimized your performance, your mindset, your empathy? Because, you know, it's anytime you see somebody who's performing in some way consistently across time at a peak level, there's things they're doing daily. What are things that you do yeah. daily that put you in this? I, I this think of goals and relationships, not goals and actions. Goals and relationships. Yeah, I remember you saying um, at the, the talk that I, I saw, you said, you know, you, we think of all the things we need to do, but if you said, if you just took like the top 25 people in your industry and made it a point to connect with those people, you'd be way better off than if you read, you know, did all these other activities. 100%. I call it a people plan or a relationship action plan. And so I manage, so I'm going to, I was asked to go to Atlanta to do something. And it's one push of a button in my CRM system to pull mm -hmm. up the, the individuals that I have the greatest aspiration to get to know better and the people I already know well. And that is so easy for me then to begin to activate that time that I have around you know critical relationships how do you and, give us CRM? Did, did you build this like do you have a relationship kind of harvey mckay type yeah. system thing what what is this crm i do we do um and it's it's described in never Eat alone and it's 
I call it FTD AOR, focus, target, define, align, outreach, renew. Focus, mm -hmm. what goal do you have around any goal? Uh, you target specific individuals that will achieve that and you prioritize those and you measure the strength of the relationship and what we call an RQ score, relationship quality score and a BI score, which is a business impact. So focus, target, define what you can do for them. Always define what you can do for them. And I always, I always imagine five, I call it five packets of generosity, five things that I could do for individuals based on my research. And then of course, when you get to know them, your entire, when you meet them, your intention is to interrogate, to figure out what you really do. You have five ideas and then you figure out what you could really do. Focus, target, define, align, which is network with networkers. I mean, I've gotten to know Tony well and Peter well and others because when you get to know connectors, I call it connecting with connectors. Um, mm -hmm. When you get to know connectors, you open up an entire world to yourself. So focus, target, define, align, outreach, having very distinct outreach strategies of meetings, events, notes, uh, et cetera, gifting, you know, all of these outreach strategies around the highest level priority individuals, focus, target, define, align, outreach, renew. So it's a constantly renewable process on a quarterly basis. I've got five people working on this system for me, for my network full time. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Relationships. This is, uh, I'm gonna have to give that a, a reread. It's, it's been a while and I'm gonna have to pick up the, the new one. Um, and the new one, hard. well, yeah, the new, the, we rewrote Never Eat Alone for the, for the post-technology era. When I wrote it originally, Facebook didn't even exist. So, nor did LinkedIn. Um, so we rewrote Never Eat Alone for the modern era uh, and that's out now. And um, leading without authority is really how do you activate it with clients and in a business context. Oh, and as far as consistent things that you do to perform well, is there any unique getting up in the morning, morning routine, diet, mindset, strategy, anything like that, that optimizes your performance? Um, you know, these days it's, it's making sure that the love of my life is happy. Well, that's new for me. Um, and you know, my view is my job is to make the love of my life so extraordinarily happy. And mm -hmm. I want to make sure that I've got that foundation. And, you know, I, I've never really put that kind of commitment to love before. And now that I do, it's game changing of uh, the return that I get, but also uh, the amount of time that I spend in it. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And you, you used to do these kind of dinner parties where you got people together. Are you still doing yeah, that? That's a part of the outreach. So FTDAO outreach dinner parties regularly um, yeah. in every city that I'm in. Uh, and it's, again, I've got a team that manages that. Um, part of the thing is I've now integrated my research with my relationship building. So reaching out to people, who I both want to get to know, but also interviewing them for my writings. Um, it's a wonderful way to elevate somebody in the conversation while also building the relationship at the same time. Amazing, you know, and, and you kind of touched on this, but as far as, you know, whether it could be salespeople, entrepreneurs looking to build their network, um, you know, what are, you, you unpack some, some key mistakes, but what are some, Kind of, you know, and you've, you've unpacked so much here, but what are a few tips that you would want somebody to see somebody do? Obviously, they want to do some research and connect, but for somebody else, you know, outside of getting the books, of course, what are a few tips that you think people should be doing like on a daily basis, like part of a system to create a ritual for? Well, again, just getting your identified names written down of around critical goals. And then working to deepen and develop the intimacy with those individuals on a regular basis. Um, and the leading with the generosity. I think I've kind of already answered that question. Yep. Um, yep. And, and, you know, the key is to have no boundaries in terms of who you have the right to build it, your team with. Um, Tony was on my list early on, you know, and now mm -hmm. I speak on his events, you know, regularly. Um, yep. I knew I would learn a lot from Tony and I, same thing as you did, led with generosity. Yeah. Yeah. We were actually connecting, as I said, because of our, our mutual friend, who's quite yeah. a connector. Right. Yeah. yeah. So he's, he's quite the connector, quite, quite a guy. 
Um, you know, is there anything that I, I didn't ask you about building a network, about authority you know, right. that- Here's what I would say. We're in a unique time right now. Um, yeah. We're at a massive inflection point in the world and it's gonna be too easy for too many people to go back to old ways of thinking, working, and being. This is an inflection point. And the people who will really leap forward five to 10 years are the ones who recognize it and aren't gonna let this three years bleed into the same way we've done things in the past. So yeah, I mean, I think the key is awaken. And that's by the way, the reason we wrote our most recent book, competing in the new world of work, 2000 executives, entrepreneurs, crowdsourcing what they're doing to not crawl out of the rubble and go back to old ways of working. But instead, I, I say, go forward to work. How do we go forward to work? And your organization, whoever you are, is struggling. Everyone's talking so much about policies. You know, are we going to be in the office three days a week, two days a week? Who cares? Focus on practices. How do you change the way you sell? What did we learn from the last two to three years? How do we continue to have more frequent touch points with people? I spent a lot of time in the book looking at how organizations like Dow Chemical reinvented their entire customer outreach for companies like Procter & Gamble during the pandemic in ways that they never want to go back to. So make sure that you start thinking about how sales changes in your organization and bring that to your organization. Be a thought leader in your own organization. Identify and, and crowdsource with your peers what you've learned in the last couple of years. Raise above your peers by virtue of uh, being a real leader and in, in, in this inflection point. Um, I would say that's the biggest, you know, challenge that I would have for your audience. That's a miss. That's beautiful. And I'm going to do more of that my, myself. You mentioned you have some events and I know you spoke at leadership and you speak in, in your are to Atlanta. Um, do you do any live events? I'm, I'm curious for myself. I don't do anything. I don't sell anything to consumers no. other than okay. books. And then we do have a learning center where every one of my books has been translated into a video course which people can get at um, keithferrazi.com. Okay. But frankly, you know, my intention is really crowdsourcing intellectual property, crowdsourcing ideas, getting them out there to the world. Um, we make our money in corporations. We make our money coaching teams, doing speaking engagements, um, really coaching teams. And I just recently hired a president, which I'm really excited about. Um, so I'm about to take a step back in the act of leadership and management of the company and spend more time doing research, more time doing writing, more time coaching select teams, spending more time in the startup and unicorn space. I got that influence from Tony and Peter with a lot of, what they, I guess they call it um, Tony Robbins Holdings or something like that. Um, you know, I, I want to spend more time in a select group of things that I really love. And um, yeah, I, I, I'm not, I've never been a, a mass audience guy. It's, a, it's your business, Eli, is a very tough one. Um, mm -hmm. You know, trying to get lots of people to buy intellectual property. Uh, you've got a very, you've got a, you've got a, you've got a very unique and powerful skill set there. Yeah, it's, uh, I've been blessed. I did about 3,400 seminars on behalf of Tony. I averaged two a day. So I go into companies and, and he, you know, he created an award based on my performance. So he, he's talked about me from stage or people just started finding me. And so I've been, been really blessed to leverage that credibility from, you know, the edification of Tony. So it's been, it's been good for me, but a lot of competition, all of that. And I see people, you know, and my mission is to help other people be more influential without all the cheesiness and lead with authenticity yeah. and connection. And, and for me, I, I remember when I saw Tony turn around a suicide the first time I thought if he could turn around a suicide, I wonder if I can use some of those te same techniques to turn around sales. And that became my mission. And so that's why, we, that's why we do what we do to use some of those things to change people's beliefs and perceptions about the offer about themselves and about the opportunity that's not based in scripts and fancy language patterns. So that's the congratulations. Journey. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed and I, and a lot of admiration. Congratulations. Oh, thank you, sir. It means a ton coming from you. So I'm going to get these books. Um, 
this is amazing and i need to reread the the older ones as well never eat alone with the updated version so you mentioned keithferrazi.com that's where people can yeah. find you yeah yeah awesome thank you so much for your time i want to be respectful of it and um we'll put all the juiciness in the show notes and um oh, that's great. I go, let me just ask you this yeah since i have you here is there anything that i can do for you you know the one thing we could do is uh i think i, I don't know if i'd mentioned this but my friend tony shea passed away during the pandemic yeah. and we started the tony shea award mm -hmm. which which celebrates entrepreneurs and leaders who are really innovating in human capital Mm -hmm. And it's something that we're doing in conjunction with the TED conference. Um, if you go to the Tony Award.com right now, I don't know when this is going to air, but right now we have a call out for applications of leaders who think they're really doing innovative things around elevating people who can apply for this award. I would love any amplification on your social or that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Because Tony was a very dear man that we lost prematurely, but we don't have to lose his legacy of deeply committed to elevating people in the workplace. So any of your followers who are who are equally committed, I'd love to get their applications. Awesome. I'll bump this one to the, the front of the list and I'm going to take Thank a you. picture to remind myself and we'll, we'll put this out and we'll put that in the show notes as well. So it's nice. Well, I thank you so much. Appreciate you. Thank you. Appreciate Cheers. you, sir. Okay. Take care.